The Holy Science by Swami Sri Yukteswar Giri. The purpose of this book is to show as clearly as possible that there is an essential unity in all religions, that there is no difference in the truths inculcated by the various faiths, that there is but one method by which the world, both external and internal, has evolved, and that there is but one goal admitted by all scriptures. But this basic truth is not one easily comprehended. The discord existing between the different religions and the ignorance of men make it almost impossible to lift the veil and have a look at this grand verity. The creeds foster a spirit of hostility and dissension. Ignorance widens the gulf that separates one creed from another. Only a few specially gifted persons can rise superior to the influence of their professed creeds and find absolute unanimity in the truths propagated by all great faiths. The object of this book is to point out the harmony underlying the various religions and to help in binding them together. This task is indeed a Herculean one, but at Allahabad I was entrusted with the mission by a holy command. Allahabad, the sacred Prayaj Tirtha, the place of confluence of the Ganges, Jumna, and Saraswati rivers, is a site for the congregation of worldly men and of spiritual devotees at the time of Kumbha Mela. Worldly men cannot transcend the mundane limit in which they have confined themselves, nor can spiritual devotees, having once renounced the world, deign to come down and mix themselves in its turmoil. Yet men, who are wholly engrossed in earthly concerns, stand in infinite need of help and guidance from those holy beings who bring light to the race. So a place there must be where union between the two sets is possible. Tirtha affords such a meeting place. Situated as it is on the beach of the world, storms and buffets touch it not. The sadhus, with a message for the benefit of humanity, find a kumbha mela to be an ideal place to impart instruction to those who can heed it. A message of such a nature I was chosen to propagate when I paid a visit to the kumbha mela being held at Allahabad in January 1894. As I was walking along the bank of the Ganges, I was summoned by a man and was afterwards honored by an interview with a great holy person, Babaji, the Guru Deva of my own guru, Lahiri Mahasaya of Banaras. This holy personage at the Kumbha Mela was thus my own Param Guruji Maharaj, though this was our first meeting. During my conversation with Babaji, we spoke of the particular classes of men who now frequent these places of pilgrimage. I humbly suggested that there were men greater by far in intelligence than those then present, men who were living in distant parts of the world, Europe and America, professing different creeds and ignorant of the real significance of the Kumbha Mela. They were men fit to hold communion with the spiritual devotees, so far as their intelligence is concerned, yet such intellectual men in foreign lands were, alas, wedded, in many cases, to rank materialism. Some of them, though famous for their investigations in the realms of science and philosophy, do not recognize the essential unity in religion. The professed creeds serve as nearly insurmountable barriers that threaten to separate mankind forever. My Param Guruji Maharaj, Babaji, smiled and honoring me with the title of Swami, imposed on me the task of this book. I was chosen, I do not know the reason why, to remove the barrier and to help in establishing the basic truth in all religions. The book is divided into four sections, according to the four stages in the development of knowledge. The highest aim of religion is atmajyanam, self-knowledge, but to attain this, knowledge of the external world is necessary. Therefore, the first section of the book deals with the gospel and seeks to establish the fundamental truth of creation and to describe the evolution and the involution of the world. All creatures, from the highest to the lowest in the link of creation, are found eager to realize three things, existence, consciousness, and bliss. This, the purpose or goal of all creatures, is the subject for discussion in the second section of the book. The third section deals with the method of realizing the three purposes of life. The fourth section discusses the revelations which come to those who have traveled far to realize the three ideals of life and are very near their destination. The method I have adopted in the book is first to enunciate a proposition in Sanskrit terms of the Oriental sages, and then to explain it by reference to the holy scriptures of the West. In this way I have tried my best to show that there is no real discrepancy, much less any real conflict, between the teachings of the East and the West. 
written as the book is under the inspiration of my Param Guru Deva and in a Dwapara age of rapid development in all departments of knowledge, I hope that the significance of the book will not be missed by those for whom it is meant. A short discussion with mathematical calculation of the yugas is necessary here in order to explain the fact that the present age for the world is Dwapara Yuga, and that 194 years of that yuga have now, in AD 1894, passed away, bringing a rapid development in man's knowledge. We learn from Oriental astronomy that moons revolve around their planets, and planets turning on their axis revolve with their moons around the sun, and the sun again, with its planets and their moons, takes some star for its duel and revolves round it in about 24,000 years of our Earth a celestial phenomenon which causes the backward movement of the equinoctial points around the zodiac. The sun also has another motion by which it revolves around a grand center called Vishnu Navi, which is the seat of the creative power Brahma, the universal magnetism. Brahma regulates Dharma, the mental virtues of the internal world. When the sun in its revolution around its duel comes to the place nearest to this grand center, the seat of Brahma, an event which takes place when the autumnal equinox comes to the first point of Aries. Dharma, the mental virtue, becomes so much developed that man can easily comprehend all, even the mysteries of spirit. After 12,000 years, when the sun goes to the place in its orbit which is farthest from Brahma, the grand center, an event which takes place when the autumnal equinox is on the first point of Libra, Dharma, the mental virtue, comes to such a reduced state that man cannot grasp anything beyond the gross material creation. Again, in the same manner, when the sun in its course of revolution begins to advance towards the place nearest to the grand center, Dharma, the mental virtue, begins to develop. This growth is gradually completed in another 12,000 years. Each of these periods of 12,000 years brings about a complete change in the system, both externally in the material world and internally in the intellectual or electric world, and is called one of the Daiba Yugas, or electric couple. Thus, in a period of 24,000 years, the sun completes the revolution around its duel and finishes one electric cycle consisting of 12,000 years in an ascending arc and 12,000 years in a descending arc. Development of Dharma, the mental virtue, is but gradual and is divided into four different stages in a period of 12,000 years. The time of 1,200 years during which the sun passes through 1 20th portion of its orbit is called Kali Yuga. Dharma, the mental virtue, is then in its first stage and is only a quarter developed. The human intellect cannot comprehend anything beyond the gross material of this ever-changing creation, the external world. The period of 2400 years during which the sun passes through the second 20th portion of its orbit is called Dwapara Yuga. Dharma, the mental virtue, is then in the second stage of its development and is but half complete. The human intellect can then comprehend the fine matters or electricities and their attributes which are the creating principles of this external world. The period of 3600 years during which the sun passes through the third 20th part of its orbit is called Treta Yuga. Dharma, the mental virtue, is then in the third stage. The human intellect becomes able to comprehend the divine magnetism, the source of all electrical forces on which the creation depends for its existence. The period of 3600 years during which the sun passes through the third 20th part of its orbit is called Treta Yuga. Dharma, the mental virtue, is then in the third stage. The human intellect becomes able to comprehend the divine magnetism, the source of all electrical forces on which the creation depends for its existence. The period of 4800 years during which the sun passes through the remaining 420th portion of its orbit on either side of the point nearest the grand center is called Satya Yuga. Dharma, the mental virtue, is then in its fourth stage and completes its full development. The human intellect can comprehend all, even God the Spirit beyond this visible world. Manu, a great Rishi of Satya Yuga, describes in his Samhita these Yugas more clearly in the following slokas. There is some Sanskrit writing which I cannot read. The period of Satya Yuga is 4,000 years in duration. 
400 years before and after Satya Yuga proper are its Santis, or periods of mutation, with the preceding and the succeeding Yugas respectively. Hence, 4,800 years in all is the proper age of Satya Yuga. In the calculation of the period of other Yugas and Yuga Santis, it is laid down that numerical one should be deducted from the numbers of both thousands and hundreds which indicated the periods of the previous Yugas and Santis. From this rule, it appears that 3,000 years is the length of Treta Yuga, and 300 years before and after are its Santis, the period of mutation, which makes a total of 3,600 years. So 2,000 years is the age of Dwapara Yuga, with 200 years before and after as its Santis, a total of 2,400 years. Lastly, 1,000 years is the length of Kali Yuga, with 100 years before and after as its Santis, a total of 1,200 years. Thus, 12,000 years, the sum total of all periods of these four Yugas, is the length of one of the Daiba Yugas, or electric couple, two of which, i.e. 24,000 years, make the electric cycle complete. 100,000 of such Daiba Yugas is the day of Brahma, the creative power or creator, when creation exists in a manifested state. The period equal to the above is its night, when this creative power sleeps and the creation is dissolved. From April 11, 501 BC, when the autumnal equinox was on the first point of Aries, the sun began to move away from the point of its orbit nearest to the grand center towards the point farthest from it, and accordingly the intellectual power of man began to diminish. During the 4,800 years which the sun took to pass through one of the Satya couples, or 420th part of its orbit, the intellect of man lost altogether the power of grasping the spiritual knowledge. During the 3,600 years following, which the sun took to pass through the descending Treta Yuga, the intellect gradually lost all power of grasping the knowledge of divine magnetism. During the 2,400 years next following, while the sun passed through descending Dwapara Yuga, the human intellect lost its power of grasping the knowledge of electricities and their attributes. In 1200 more years, during the year AD 499, the sun had passed through the descending Kali Yuga and had reached the point in its orbit which is farthest from the grand center. The autumnal equinox was on the first point of Libra. The intellectual power of man was so much diminished that it could no longer comprehend anything beyond the gross material of creation. The period around A.D. 500 was thus the darkest period of Kali Yuga and of the whole cycle of 24,000 years. History indeed bears out the accuracy of these ancient calculations of the Indian Rishis and records the widespread ignorance and suffering in all nations at that period. From A.D. 499 onwards, the sun began to advance towards the grand center and the intellect of man started gradually to develop. During 1100 years of the ascending Kali Yuga, which brings us to A.D. 1599, the human intellect was so dense that it could not comprehend the electricities, Sukshmabhuta, the fine matters of creation. In the political world also, generally speaking, there was no peace in any kingdom. Subsequent to this period, when the 100-year transitional Santi of Kali Yuga set in to effect a union with the following Dwapara Yuga, men began to notice the existence of fine matters, the attributes of five electricities, Pancha Tun Matra, and political peace began to be established. About A.D. 1600, William Gilbert discovered magnetic forces and observed the presence of electricity in all material substances. In 1609, Kepler discovered important laws of astronomy, and Galileo produced a telescope. In 1621, Drebel of Holland invented the microscope. About 1670, Newton discovered the law of gravitation. Thomas Savory made use of a steam engine in raising water about 1700. Twenty years later, Stephen Gray discovered the action of electricity on the human body. In the political world, people began to have respect for themselves, and civilization advanced in many ways. England united with Scotland became a powerful kingdom. Napoleon Bonaparte introduced his new legal code into southern Europe. America won its independence, and Europe was peaceful in many ways. With the advance of science, the world began to be covered with railways and telegraphic wires. 
By the help of steam engines, electric machines, and many other instruments, fine matters were brought into practical use, although their nature was not clearly understood. After 1899, on the completion of the period of 200 years of Dwapara Santi, the time of mutation, the true Dwapara Yuga of 2,000 years will commence and will give to mankind in general a thorough understanding of the electrical attributes. Such is the great influence of time which governs the universe. No man can overcome this influence except he who, blessed with pure love, the heavenly gift of nature, becomes divine being baptized in the sacred stream pranava, the holy om vibration. He comprehends the kingdom of God. The position of the world in the Dropara Santi era at present, A.D. 1894, is not correctly shown in the Hindu almanacs. The astronomers and astrologers who calculate the almanacs have been guided by wrong annotations of certain Sanskrit scholars, such as Kulu Bhatta, of the Dark Age of Kali Yuga and now maintain that the length of Kali Yuga is 432,000 years, of which 4,994 have, in A.D. 1894, passed away, leaving 427,006 years still remaining, a dark prospect, and fortunately one not true. The mistake crept into the almanac for the first time about 700 B.C., during the time of Raja Parikshita, just after the completion of the last descending Dwapara Yuga. At that time, Maharaja Judhisthir, noticing the appearance of the dark Kali Yuga, made over his throne to his grandson, the said Raja Parikshita. Maharaja Judhisthir, together with all the wise men of his court, retired to the Himalaya Mountains, the paradise of the world. Thus there was none in the court of Raj. Parikshita, who could understand the principle of correctly calculating the ages of the several yugas. Hence, after the completion of the 2400 years of the then-current Dwapara Yuga, no one dared to make the introduction of the Dark Kali Yuga more manifest by beginning to calculate from its first year and to put an end to the number of Dwapara years. According to this wrong method of calculation, therefore, the first year of Kali Yuga was numbered 2401, along with the age of Dwapara Yuga. In A.D. 499, when 1200 years, the length of the true Kali Yuga was complete, and the sun had reached the point of its orbit farthest from the grand center, when the autumnal equinox was on the first point of Libra in the heavens, the age of Kali in its darkest period was then numbered by 3,600 years instead of by 1,200. With the commencement of the ascending Kali Yuga, after A.D. 499, the sun began to advance in its orbit nearer to the grand center, and accordingly the intellectual power of man started to develop. Therefore, the mistake in the almanacs began to be noticed by the wise men of the time who found that the calculations of the ancient rishis had fixed the period of one Kali Yuga at 1,200 years only. But as the intellect of these wise men was not yet suitably developed, they could make out only the mistake itself and not the reason for it. By way of reconciliation, they fancied that 1,200 years, the real age of Kali, were not the ordinary years of our earth, but were so many Daiba years consisting of 12 Daiba months of 30 Daiba days each, with each Daiba day being equal to one ordinary solar year of our Earth. Hence, according to these men, 1,200 years of Kali Yuga must be equal to 432,000 years of our Earth. In coming to a right conclusion, however, we should take into consideration the position of the vernal equinox at spring in the year 1893. The astronomical reference books show the equinox now to be at 20 degrees, 54 minutes, 36 seconds, distant from the first point of Aries, the fixed star Ravati, and by calculation it will appear that 1394 years have passed away since the time when the vernal equinox began to recede from the first point in Aries. Deducting 1,200 years, the length of the last ascending Kali Yuga, from 1,394 years, we get 194 to indicate the present year of the world's entrance into the ascending Dwapara Yuga. The mistake of older almanacs will thus be clearly explained when we add 3,600 years to this period of 1,394 years and get 4,994 years, 
which according to the prevailing mistaken theory now represents the present year, A.D. 1894, in the Hindu almanacs. Referring to the diagram given in this book, the reader will see that the autumnal equinox is now, in A.D. 1894, falling among the stars of the Virgo constellation and in the ascending Dwapara Yuga. In this book, certain truths such as those about the properties of magnetism, its auras, different sorts of electricities, etc., have been mentioned, although modern science has not yet fully discovered them. As for the five sorts of electricity, it may be observed here that they can be easily understood if one will direct his attention to the nerve properties which are purely electrical in nature. Each of the five sensory nerves has its characteristic and unique function to perform. The optic nerve carries light and does not perform the functions of the auditory and other nerves. The auditory nerve in turn carries sound only without performing the functions of any other nerves, and so on. Thus it is clear that there are five sorts of electricity, corresponding to the five properties of cosmic electricity. So far as magnetic properties are concerned, it may be remembered that the grasping power of the human intellect is at present so limited that it would be quite useless to attempt to make the matter understood by the general public. The intellect of men in Treta Yuga will comprehend the attributes of divine magnetism. The next Treta Yuga will start in A.D. 4099. There are indeed exceptional personages now living who, having overcome the influence of time, can grasp today what ordinary people cannot grasp. But this book is not for those exalted ones who require nothing of it. In concluding this introduction, we may observe that the different planets, exercising their influence over the various days of the week, have lent their names to their respective days. Similarly, the different constellations of stars, having influence over various months, have lent their names to the Hindu months. Each of these great yugas also has much influence over the period of time covered by it. Hence, in designating the years, it is desirable that such terms should indicate to which yuga they belong. As the yugas are calculated from the positions of the equinox, the method of numbering the years in reference to their respective yuga is based on a scientific principle. Its use will obviate much inconvenience which has arisen in the past owing to the various eras being associated with persons of eminence rather than with celestial phenomena of the fixed stars. We, therefore, propose to name and number the year in which this introduction has been written as 194 Druapara instead of A.D. 1894 to show the exact time of the Yuga now passing. This method of calculation was prevalent in India till the reign of Raja Vikramaditya, when the Sambat era was introduced. As the Yuga method of calculation recommends itself to reason, we follow it and recommend that it be followed by the public in general. Now, in this 194th year of Dwapara Yuga, the Dark Age of Kali having long passed away, the world is reaching out for spiritual knowledge, and men require loving help from one another. The publishing of this book, requested from me by my holy Param Guru Maharaj, will, I hope, be of spiritual significance. Swami Sri Yukteswar Giri, Sarampur, Bengal, the 26th Falgun, 194 Juapara, A.D. 1894. Chapter 1. The Gospel The Eternal Father God, Swami Param Brahma, is the only real substance, Sat, and is all in all in the universe. Man possesses eternal faith and believes intuitively in the existence of a substance of which the objects of sense, sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell, the component parts of this visible world, are but properties. As man identifies himself with his material body composed of the aforesaid properties, he is able to comprehend by his imperfect organs these properties only and not the substance to which these properties belong. The Eternal Father God, the only substance in the universe, is, therefore, not comprehensible by man of this material world, unless he becomes divine by lifting himself above this creation of darkness Maya. Vide Hebrew 11.1 1 and John 8.28. Quote, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Unquote. Quote, then Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. Unquote. 
the almighty force Shakti, or in other words, the eternal joy Ananda, which produces the world, and the omniscient feeling Chit, which makes this world conscious, demonstrate the nature Prakriti of God the Father. As man is the likeness of God, directing his attention inwards, he can comprehend within him the said force and feeling, the sole properties of his self, the force almighty as his will, basana, with enjoyment, boga, and the feeling omniscient as his consciousness, chitana, that enjoys bokta, vide Genesis 1, 27. Quote, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. Unquote. The manifestation of omnipotent force, repulsion, in its complementary portion, omniscient feeling, or love the attraction, is vibration which appears as a peculiar sound. The word Amen Aum. In its different aspects, Aum presents the idea of change, which is time, Kal, in the ever unchangeable and the idea of division, which is space, dish, in the ever-indivisible. The ensuing effect is the idea of particles, the innumerable atoms, patra or anu. These four, the word, time, space, and atom, therefore, are one and the same, and substantially nothing but mere ideas. This manifestation, the word, becoming flesh, the external material, created this visible world. So this word, Amen Aum, being the manifestation of the eternal nature of the Almighty Father, or His own self, is inseparable from and nothing but God Himself, as the burning power is inseparable from and nothing but the fire itself. Vide Revelations 3.14 and John 1, 1, 3, 14. Quote, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Unquote. These atoms, which represent within and without the four ideas mentioned above, are the thrones of spirit, the Creator that shining on them creates this universe. They are called in mass Maya, the darkness as they keep the spiritual light out of comprehension, and each of them separately is called abidya, the ignorance, as it makes man ignorant even of his own self. Hence the aforesaid four ideas which give rise to all those confusions are mentioned in the Bible as so many beasts. Man, so long as he identifies himself with his gross material body, holds a position far inferior to that of the primal fourfold atoms and necessarily fails to comprehend the same. But when he raises himself to the level thereof, he not only comprehends this atom both inside and outside, but also the whole creation, both unmanifested and manifested, i.e. before and behind. Vide Revelations 4, 6. Quote, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Unquote. The manifestation of Prembijam Chit, attraction, the omniscient love, is life, the omnipresent Holy Spirit, and is called the Holy Ghost, Kuthastha Chaitanya, or Purushottama, which shines on darkness Maya to attract every portion of it towards divinity. But the darkness Maya, or its individual parts, Abhidya, the ignorance, being repulsion itself, cannot receive or comprehend the spiritual light, but reflects it. This Holy Ghost, being the manifestation of the omniscient nature of the Eternal Father God, is no other substance than God Himself. And so these reflections of spiritual rays are called the Sons of God, Avas Chaitanya or Purush, Vide John 1, 4, 5.11, quote, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, unquote. Quote, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, unquote. Quote, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, unquote. This atom, Abidya, the ignorance, being under the influence of universal love, cheat, the Holy Spirit becomes spiritualized like iron filings and magnetic aura, 
and possessed of consciousness the power of feeling, when it is called mahot, the heart chitwa, and being such the idea of separate existence of self appears in it, which is called ahamkar ego, the son of man. Thus, being magnetized, it gets two poles, one of which attracts it towards the real substance, sat, and the other repels it from the same. The former is called sattva, or buddhi, the intelligence which determines what is truth, and the latter, which being a particle of repulsion, the almighty force spiritualized as aforesaid, produces the ideal world for enjoyment, ananda, and is called anandatva, or manas, the mind. This spiritualized atom, chitwa, the heart, being the repulsion manifested, produced five sorts of aura, electricities, from its five different parts, one from the middle, two from the two extremities, and the other two from the spaces intervening between the middle and each of the extremities. These five sorts of electricities being attracted under the influence of universal love, the Holy Ghost, towards the real substance sat, produce a magnetic field which is called the body of Sattva Buddhi, the intelligence. These five electricities, being the causes of all other creations, are called Pancha Tattva, the five root causes, and are named as causal body of Purush, the son of God. These electricities being evolved from the polarized Chitwa are also in a polarized state and are endowed with its three attributes or Gunas Sattva, the positive, Tama, the negative, and Rajas, the neutralizing. The positive attributes of these five electricities are Jananyandriyas, the organs of sense, organs of smell, taste, sight, touch, and hearing, and being attracted under the influence of Manas, mind, the opposite pole of the spiritualized atom constitutes a body of the same. The neutralizing attributes of them are Karmandriyas, the organs of action, those of excretion, generation, motion, absorption, and articulation. These organs being the manifestation of the neutralizing energy of the spiritualized atom, Chitwa, the heart, constitutes an energetic body called the body of energy, the life, Pran. And their negative attributes are the five Tan Matras, or objects of the senses of smell, taste, sight, touch, and sound, which through the neutralizing power of the organs of action being united with the organs of sense, satiate the desires of the heart. These fifteen attributes with two poles, mind and intelligence, of the spiritualized atom constitute linga sharir, or shukshma sharir, the fine material body of Purush, the son of God. The aforesaid five objects, which are the negative attributes of the five electricities, being combined together produce the idea of the gross matters which appear to us in five different varieties. Kashiti, the solid, ap, the liquid, tej, the fiery, marut, the gaseous, and bioma or akasha, the ethereal. These constitute the outer covering called shtul sharir, the gross material body of Purush, the son of God. These five gross matters and the aforesaid fifteen attributes together with manas the mind, buddhi the intelligence, chitwa the heart, and ahamkar the ego constitute the twenty-four principles or elders as mentioned in the Bible. Vide Revelations 4, 4, quote, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, unquote. The aforesaid twenty-four principles which completed the creation of darkness, Maya, are nothing but mere development of ignorance, Abidya. And this ignorance being composed only of ideas as mentioned above, this creation has no substantial existence in reality, but is a mere play of ideas on the eternal substance, God the Father. This universe, thus described, commencing from the eternal substance God down to the gross material creation, has been distinguished into seven different spheres, swargas or lokas. The foremost of these is satya loka, the sphere of God, the only real substance set in the universe. No name can describe it, nor can anything in the creation of darkness or light designate it. This sphere is therefore called anam, the nameless. The next in order is Tapaloka, 
the sphere of the Holy Spirit, which is the eternal patience, as it remains forever undisturbed by any limited idea, and because it is not approachable even by the sons of God, as such it is called, Agam the inaccessible. Next is Jana Loka, the sphere of spiritual reflection, the sons of God, wherein the idea of separate existence of self originates. As this sphere is above the comprehension of any body in the creation of darkness, Maya, it is called Alaksha, the incomprehensible. Then comes Maharloka, the sphere of atom, the beginning of the creation of darkness, Maya, upon which the spirit is reflected. This, the connecting link, is the only way between the spiritual and material creation and is called the door, Dasam Adwar. Around this atom is Sivaloka, the sphere of magnetic aura, the electricities. This sphere, being characterized by the absence of all the creation, even the organs and their objects, the fine material things, is called Mahashunya, the great vacuum. The next is Bhubaloka, the electric attributes. As the gross matters of the creation are entirely absent from this sphere, and it is conspicuous by the presence of the fine matters only, it is called Shunya, the vacuum ordinary. The last and lowest sphere is Buloka, the sphere of gross material creation, which is always visible to everybody. As God created man in his own image, so is the body of man like unto the image of this universe. The material body of man has also seven vital places within it called patals. Man, turning toward his self and advancing in the right way, perceives the spiritual light in these places which are described in the Bible as so many churches. The lights, like stars, perceived therein are so many angels. Vide Revelations 1, 12, 13, 16, 20. Quote, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Unquote. Quote, and he had in his right hand seven stars, unquote. Quote, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches, unquote. The above-mentioned seven spheres, or swargas, and seven patals constitute the fourteen bubans, the fourteen distinguishable stages of the creation. The Purush, the Son of God, is screened by five coverings called koshas sheaths. The first of these five is heart chitwa, the atom composed of four ideas, as mentioned before, which feels or enjoys, and thus being the seat of enjoyment, ananda, is called ananda moya kosha. The second is the magnetic aura electricities, manifestations of buddhi, the intelligence, which determines what is truth. Thus being the seat of knowledge, jinyan, it is called jinyana moya kosha. The third is the body of manas, the mind, composed of the organs of sense as mentioned above, and is called the manamaya kosha. The fourth is the body of energy, life force, or pran, composed of the organs of action as described above, and is so called the pranamaya kosha. The fifth and the last of these sheaths is the gross matter, the atom's outer coating, which becoming ana, the nourishment, supports this visible world, and thus is called the anamoya kosha. The action of repulsion, the manifestation of the omnipotent energy being thus completed, the action of attraction, the manifestation of the omniscient love in the core of the heart, begins to be manifested. Under the influence of this omniscient love, the attraction, the atoms being attracted towards one another, come nearer and nearer, taking ethereal, gaseous, fiery, liquid, and solid forms. Thus this visible world becomes adorned with suns, planets, and moons, which we call the inanimate kingdom of the creation. In this manner, when the action of the divine love becomes well developed, the evolution of avidya, ignorance, the particle of darkness, maya, the omnipotent energy manifested, begins to be withdrawn. Anamoya kosha, the atom's outer coating of gross matter being thus withdrawn, pranamaya kosha, the sheath composed of karmendriya, the organs of action, begin to operate. In this organic state, 
the atoms embracing each other more close to their heart appears to us as the vegetable kingdom in the creation. When the pranamaya kosha becomes withdrawn, the manamaya kosha, the sheath composed of inyanandriyas, the organs of sense, comes to the light. The atoms then perceive the nature of the external world and attracting other atoms of different nature form bodies as necessary for enjoyment and thus the animal kingdom appears in the creation. When mana maya kosha becomes withdrawn, jnana maya kosha, the body of intelligence composed of electricities, becomes perceptible. The atom, getting the power of determining right and wrong, becomes man, the rational being in the creation. When man cultivating the divine spirit, omniscient love, within his heart could withdraw this jnana maya kosha, then the innermost sheath, chitwa, the heart, composed of four ideas, becomes manifested. Man is then called debata, or angel, in the creation. When the heart, or innermost sheath, is also withdrawn, there is no longer anything to keep man in bondage to this creation of darkness, maya. He then becomes free, sanyasi, the son of God, and enters into the creation of light. When man compares his ideas relating gross matters conceived in the wakeful state with his conception of ideas in dream, the similarity existing between them naturally leads him to conclude this external world also is not what it appears to be. When he looks for further explanation, he finds that all his wakeful conceptions are substantially nothing but mere ideas caused by the union of five objects of sense, the negative attributes of the five internal electricities with the five organs of sense their positive attributes. Though the medium of five organs of action, the neutralizing attributes of the electricities. This union is affected by the operation of mind, manas, and conceived by the intelligence, buddhi. Thus it is clear that all conceptions which man forms in his wakeful state are mere inferential paraksha jinyan, a matter of inference only. In this way, when man understands by his paroksha jinyan the nothingness of the external world, he appreciates the position of John, the divine personage who witnessed light and bore testimony of Christ after his heart's love, the heavenly gift of nature, had become developed. Any advanced sincere seeker may be fortunate in having the godlike company of some one of such personages who may kindly stand to him as his spiritual preceptor, Sat Guru, the Savior. Following affectionately the holy precepts of these divine personages, man becomes able to direct all his organs inward to their common center, sensorium, trikuti, or shashumnajwar, the door of the interior, where he comprehends the voice, like a peculiar knocking sound, the word Amen, Om, and the God-sent luminous body of Radha, called John in the Bible. Vide Revelations 3, 13, 20. In John 1, 6, 8, 23. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. From the peculiar nature of this sound, issuing as it does like a stream from a higher unknown region and losing itself in the gross material creation, it is figuratively styled by various sects of people by the name of different rivers which they consider as sacred, e.g. Ganja by the Aryans, Jumna by the Baishnava, Jordan by the Christians, etc. Through his luminous body, man, believing in the existence of the true light, the life of this universe, becomes baptized or absorbed in the holy stream of the sound. This baptism is, so to speak, the second birth of man and is called Bhakti Yoga, without which man can never become able to comprehend the real position of the internal world, the kingdom of God. Vide John 1, 9 and 3, 3. Two quotes follow. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In this state, the Son of Man begins to repent. Latin, repents, to creep. And turning back from the gross material creation, creeps towards his divinity, the eternal substance, God. When the development of ignorance begins to recede, man gradually comprehends the true character of this creation of darkness, Maya, as a mere ideal play of the supreme nature on his own self, the only real substance. This true comprehension is called Aparoksha Jinyan. When all the developments of ignorance are withdrawn, the heart's being perfectly clear and purified no longer merely reflects the spiritual light, but receives or manifests the same, and thus being consecrated and anointed becomes Sanyasi, or Christ the Savior. Vide John 1.33 Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Through this Savior, the Son of Man becomes again baptized or absorbed in the stream of spiritual light, and coming above the creation of darkness, Maya, enters into the spiritual world and becomes unified with Abbas Chaitanya, or Purush, the Son of God, as was the case with Lord Jesus of Nazareth. This is the state when man is saved forever and ever from the bondage of darkness, Maya. Vide John 1, 12, and 3, 5. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When man, thus entering into the spiritual world, becomes a son of God, he comprehends the universal light, the Holy Ghost, as a perfect whole and his self as nothing but a mere idea resting on a fragment of the Om light. Then he sacrifices himself to the Holy Ghost, the altar of God, i.e., abandons the vain idea of his separate existence and becomes one integral whole. Thus being one with the universal Holy Spirit of God the Father, he becomes unified with the real substance, God. This unification of self with the eternal substance, God, is called Kaivalya, Vide Revelations 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Chapter 2 The Goal When man understands even by way of inference the true nature of this creation, the true relation existing between that creation and himself, when he further understands that he is completely blinded by the influence of darkness, Maya, that it is the bondage of darkness alone which makes him forget his real self and brings about all his sufferings. He naturally wishes to be relieved from all these evils. This relief from evil, or the liberation from the bondage of darkness, Maya, becomes the prime object of his life. When man raises himself above the ideal creation of this darkness, Maya, and passes completely out of its influence, he becomes liberated from bondage and is placed in his real self, the eternal spirit. On attaining this liberation, man becomes saved from all his troubles, and all the desires of his heart are fulfilled, so the ultimate aim of his life is accomplished. So long, however, as man identifies himself with his material body and fails to find repose in his true self, he feels his wants according as his heart's desires remain unsatisfied. To satisfy them, he has to appear often in flesh and blood on the stage of life, subject to the influence of darkness, maya, and has to suffer all the troubles of life and death, not only in the present but in the future as well. Ignorance, abidya, is misconception, or is the erroneous conception of the existence of that which does not exist. Through abidya, man believes that this material creation is the only thing which substantially exists, there being nothing beyond, forgetting that this material creation is substantially nothing and is a mere play of ideas on the eternal spirit, the only real substance beyond the comprehension of the material creation. This ignorance is not only a trouble in itself, but is also the source of all other troubles in man. In order to understand how this ignorance is the source of all other troubles, we should remember, 
as has been explained in the previous chapter, that ignorance, abidya, is nothing but a particle of darkness, maya, taken distributively, and as such it possesses the two properties of maya. The one is its darkening power by the influence of which man is prevented from grasping anything beyond the material creation. This darkening power produces asmita, or egoism, being the identification of self with the material body, which is but the development of atom, the particles of the universal force, and avini besha, or tenacity, to the condition. By virtue of the second of the properties of maya, ignorance, or abidya, in its polarized state produces an attraction for certain objects and repulsion for others. The objects so attracted are the objects of pleasure for which an attachment, raga, is formed. The objects that are repulsed are the objects producing pain for which an aversion, dwesha, is formed. By the influence of these five troubles, ignorance, egotism, attachment, aversion, and tenacity to the material creation, man is induced to involve himself in egoistic works and in consequence he suffers. With man, the cessation of all sufferings is artha, the heart's immediate aim. The complete extirpation of all these sufferings, their recurrence becoming impossible, is the paramartha, the ultimate goal. Man naturally feels great necessity for sat, existence, chit, consciousness, and ananda, bliss. These three are the real necessities of the human heart and have nothing to do with anything outside his self. They are essential properties of his own nature, as explained in the previous chapter. When man becomes fortunate in securing the favor of any divine personage, Satguru, the Savior, and affectionately following his holy precepts is able to direct all his organs inward, he becomes capable of satisfying all the wants of his heart and can thereby get contentment, Ananda, the real bliss. With his heart thus contented, man becomes able to fix his attention upon anything he chooses and can comprehend all its aspects. So chit, consciousness of all the modifications of nature up to his first and primal manifestation, the word Amen Om, and even of his own real self, gradually appears. And being absorbed in the stream thereof, man becomes baptized and begins to repent towards his divinity, the Eternal Father, whence he had fallen. Vide Revelation 2.51 Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Man, being conscious of his own real position, and of the nature of this creation of darkness, Maya, becomes possessed of absolute power over it, and gradually withdraws all the development of ignorance. In this way, coming above the control of this creation of darkness, Maya, he comprehends his own self as indestructible and ever-existing real substance. So sat, the existence of self, comes to light. All the necessities of the heart, sat, existence, chit, consciousness, and ananda, bliss, having been attained, ignorance, the mother of all evils, becomes emaciated, and consequently all troubles of this material world, which are the sources of all sorts of sufferings, cease forever. Thus the ultimate aim of the heart is affected. In this state, all the necessities having been attained and the ultimate aim affected, the heart becomes perfectly purified and instead of reflecting the spiritual light, receives the same, and thus being consecrated or anointed by the Holy Spirit, becomes Christ the Anointed, Savior. Entering the kingdom of spiritual light becomes the Son of God. In this state, man comprehends his self as a fragment of the universal Holy Spirit, and abandoning the vain idea of his separate existence, unifies himself with the eternal spirit, i.e., becomes one and the same with God and Father. This unification of self with God is kaivalya, which is the ultimate object of the created being. Vide John 14, 11. Believe me that I am the Father, and the Father in me. Chapter 3. The Procedure Tapa is religious mortification or patience both in enjoyments and sufferings. Shadhyaya is shraban, study, with manan, the attention, and thereby nidhidyasan, forming of an idea of the true faith about self, i.e., what I am, whence I came, where shall I go, what I have come for, and such other matters concerning self. Brahmanidan 
is the baptism or merging of self in the stream of the holy sound, pranava, which is the holy work to attain salvation and the only way by which man can repent to his divinity, the eternal Father, whence he had fallen. Vide Revelations 2, 19. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. This holy sound, pranava, sabda, appears spontaneously through culture of shraddha, the energetic tendency of heart's natural love, virya, the moral courage, smriti, the true conception, and samadhi, the true consecration. This heart's natural love is the principal thing to attain a holy life. When this love, the heavenly gift of nature, appears in the heart, it removes all exciting causes from the system and cools it down to a perfectly normal state, and invigorating the vital powers, excretes all foreign matters, the germs of diseases from it by natural ways, perspiration, etc., and thereby makes man perfectly healthy in body and mind, and enables him to understand the proper guidance of nature. When this love becomes developed in man, it makes him able to understand the real position of his own self as well of others surrounding him. With the help of this developed love, man becomes fortunate in getting the godlike company of the divine personages and is saved forever. Without this love, man cannot live in the natural way, neither can he keep company of the fit person for his own welfare. He becomes often excited by the foreign matters taken into his system through mistakes in understanding the guidance of nature, and in consequence he suffers in body and mind. He can never get any peace whatever, and his life becomes a burden. Hence the culture of this love, the heavenly gift, is the principal thing for the attainment of holy salvation. It is beyond doubt impossible for man to advance a step towards the same without it. Vide Revelation 2, 2 through 4. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. As explained in the previous chapter, this creation is substantially nothing but a mere ideal play of nature on the only real substance, God the Eternal Father, who is Guru, the Supreme, in this universe. All things of this creation are therefore no other substance than this Guru, the Supreme Father God himself, perceived in plurality by the manifold aspects of the play of nature. Vide John 10, 34, and Psalms 82. 6. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are gods? I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Out of this creation, an object which relieves us of our miseries and doubts, and administers peace to us, however insignificant the same may be, whether animate or inanimate, is entitled to our utmost respect. Even if it be an object of vilest contempt for others, it should be accepted as Savior Sat, and its company as godlike, which should always be kept. That which produces the opposite results of destroying our peace, throwing us into doubts, and creating our miseries, should be considered Asat, the bane of all good, and should be avoided as such. This idea led the Indian sages to say, Apshu Deva Manushyanam Dibi Deva Manishinam, Kashtalo Shrachu, Murkanam, Juktashyatyam, Devata. Men to get salvation choose as their savior the objects which they can comprehend according to their own acquirements. Thus, in general, people would think that illness is a dire calamity, and as water, when properly administered, tends to remove illness they choose for their savior or divinity, water itself. Philosophers, being able to comprehend the eternal electric light which shines within them, find their heart's love flow energetically towards the light that relieves them of all exciting causes, cools down their systems to a normal state, and invigorating their vital powers makes them perfectly healthy both in body and in mind. They then accept this light as their divinity or the Savior. 
ignorant people in their blind faith would accept a piece of wood or stone as their savior or divinity in the external creation for which their heart's natural love will develop till by its energetic tendency it will relieve them of all exciting causes in their system and cool their system down to a normal state and invigorate their vital powers. The adepts, on the other hand, having full control over the whole material world, find their divinity or savior in self and not outside in the external world. To keep company with one is not only to be with his person, but also to associate him with heart's love and to be one with him in principle. This has been very well expressed by Lord Bacon. A crowd is not a company. It is a mere gallery of faces. To keep company with one is not only to be with his person, but also to associate him with heart's love and to be one with him in principle. This has been very well expressed by Lord Bacon. Quote, a crowd is not a company, it is a mere gallery of faces, unquote. To keep company, therefore, with the godlike object is to associate him with sradhya, i.e., heart's love intensified in the sense above explained, by keeping his appearances and attributes fully in mind, and by reflecting on the same and affectionately following his instructions lamb-like. Vide John 1.29 Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. By so doing, when man becomes able to conceive the sublime status of his divine brothers, he may be fortunate in remaining in their company, and in securing help from any one of them whom he may choose as his spiritual preceptor, Satguru, the Savior. Thus, to resume, virya or moral courage can be obtained by the culture of sradhya, i.e., by devoting one's natural love to his preceptor, by being always in his company, and following with affection his holy instructions as they are freely and spontaneously given. Firmness of moral courage can be attained by the culture of yama, the religious forbearances, i.e., abstention from cruelty, dishonesty, covetousness, unnatural living, and unnecessary possessions, and by niyama, the religious observances, i.e., purity in body and mind, cleaning the body externally and internally from all foreign matters, which being fermented creates different sorts of diseases in the system, and clearing the mind from all prejudices and dogmas which make one narrow, contentment in all circumstances, and obedience to the holy precepts of the divine personages. To understand what natural living is, it will be necessary to distinguish it from what is unnatural, Living depends on the selection of 1. Food, 2. Dwelling, and 3. Company. To live naturally, the lower animals can select these for themselves by the help of their instinct and the natural sentinels placed at the sensory entrances, the organs of sight, smell, and taste. With men in general, these organs, however, are so much perverted by unnatural living from very infancy that no reliance can be placed on their judgments. To understand, therefore, what our natural needs are, we ought to depend on observation, experiment, and reason. First, to select our natural food, our observation should be directed to the formation of the organs which aid in digestion and nutrition, the teeth and digestive canal, to the natural tendency of the organs of sense which guides animals to their foods. First, to select our natural food, our observation should be directed to the formation of the organs which aid in digestion and nutrition, the teeth and digestive canal, to the natural tendency of the organs of sense which guide animals to their food, and to the nourishment of the young. By observation of the teeth, we find that in carnivorous animals the incisors are little developed, but the canines are of striking lengths, smooth and pointed, to seize the prey. The molars are also pointed. These points, however, do not meet but fit closely side by side to separate the muscular fibers. In the herbivorous animals, the incisors are strikingly developed. The canines are stunted, though occasionally developed into weapons as in elephants. The molars are broad-topped and furnished with enamel on the sides only. In the frugivores, all the teeth are nearly of the same height. Canines are little projected, conical, and blunt, non-intended, obviously, for seizing prey, but for exertion of strength. The molars are broad-topped and furnished at the top with enamel folds to present waste caused by their side motion, but not pointed to help in chewing flesh. In omnivorous animals, 
Like bears, on the other hand, the incisors resemble those of the herbivores. The canines are like those of the carnivorous, and the molars are both pointed and broad top to serve a twofold purpose. Now, if we observe the formation of the teeth in man, we find that these do not resemble those of the carnivorous, neither do they resemble the teeth either of the herbivorous or of the omnivorous. They do resemble exactly those of the frugivorous animals. The reasonable inference, therefore, is that man is a frugivorous or fruit-eating animal. By our observation of the digestive canal, we find that the bowels of carnivorous animals are three to five times the length of their body, measuring from the mouth to the anus, and their stomach is almost spherical. The bowels of the herbivorous are 20 to 28 times the length of their body, and their stomach is more extended and of compound build. But the bowels of the frugivorous animals are 10 to 12 times the length of their body, and their stomach is somewhat broader than that of the carnivorous and has a continuation in the duodenum serving the purpose of a second stomach. This is exactly the formation we find in human beings, though anatomy says that the human bowels are three to five times the length of their body, making a mistake by measuring the body from the crown to the soles instead of from mouth to the anus. Thus, we can again draw our inference that man is, in all probability, a frugivorous animal. By observation of the natural tendency of the organs of sense, the guidepost to determine what is nutritious and by which all animals are directed to their food, we find that when the carnivorous animal finds a prey, he becomes so much delighted that his eyes begin to sparkle, and he boldly seizes the prey and greedily laps the jetting blood, while on the contrary, the herbivorous animal refuses even his natural food, leaving it untouched if it is sprinkled with a little blood. His senses of smell and of sight lead him to select grass and other herbs for his food, which he tastes most delightfully. Similarly, with the frugivorous animal, we find that their senses always direct them to fruits of the trees and field. In men also, we find that their senses of smell, etc., never lead them to slaughter any animal, on the contrary, they cannot bear even the sight of it. Slaughterhouses are always recommended to be removed far from the towns. Men often pass strict ordinances forbidding the uncovered transportation of flesh meats. Can flesh then be styled as the natural food of man, when both his eyes and his nose are so much against it? Unless his senses are deceived by cooking with spices, salt, sugar, etc.? On the other hand, how delightful do we find the fragrance of fruits? the very sight of which even makes the mouth water. It may also be noticed that various grains and roots possess an agreeable odor and taste, though faint, even when unprepared. Thus again, we are led to infer from these observations that man was decidedly intended to be a frugivorous animal. By the observation of the nourishment of the young, we find that milk is undoubtedly the food of the newborn babe. Abundant milk is not supplied in the breast of the mother if she does not take fruits, grains, and vegetables as her natural food. Hence, from these observations, the only conclusion that can reasonably be drawn is that various grains, fruits, roots, and for beverage, milk, and pure water openly exposed to air and sun are decidedly the best natural food for man. These being congenial to the system when taken according to the power of the digestive organs, well chewed and mixed with saliva, are always easily assimilated. Other foods are unnatural to men and being uncongenial to the system are necessarily foreign to it. When these foods get access, when these foods get access to the stomach, they are not properly assimilated. Mixed with the blood, they accumulate in the excretory and other organs not properly adapted to them. When they cannot find their way out, they subside in tissue crevices by the law of gravitation, and being fermented produce diseases, mental and physical, and ultimately lead to premature death. Experiment also proves that the non-irritant diet natural to the vegetarian is, almost without exception, admirably suited to children's development both physical and mental. Their mind, understanding, will, the principal faculties, temper, and general disposition are also properly developed. We find that when extraordinary means such as excessive fasting, scourging, or monastic confinement are resorted to for the purpose of suppressing the sexual passions, these means seldom produce the desired effect. 
Experiment shows, however, that the man can easily overcome these passions, the arch enemy of morality, by a natural living on a non-irritant diet, above referred to. Thereby they get a calmness of mind by which every psychologist knows is the most favorable to mental activity and to a clear understanding as well as to a judicial way of thinking. Something more should be said here about the natural instinct of propagation, which is, next to the instinct of self-preservation, the strongest in the animal body. Sexual desire, like all other desires, has a normal and an abnormal or diseased state, the latter resulting only from the foreign matter accumulated by unnatural living as mentioned above. In the sexual desire, every one has a very accurate thermometer to indicate the condition of his health. This desire is forced from its normal state by irritation of nerves resulting from the pressure of foreign matter accumulated in the system, which is exerted on the sexual apparatus and is at first manifested by an increased sexual desire followed by the gradual decrease of potency. This sexual desire in its normal state makes man quite free from all disturbing lusts and operates on the organism awaking a wish for appeasement only very infrequently. Here again, experiment shows that this desire, like all other desires, is always normal in individuals who lead a natural life as mentioned. The sexual organ, the junction of important nerve extremities, particularly of the sympathetic and the spinal nerves, which are the principal nerves of the abdomen, which, through their connection with the brain, are capable of enlivening the whole system, is in a sense the root of the tree of life. Man, well instructed in the proper use of sex, can keep his body and mind in proper health and can live a pleasant life throughout. The practical teachings of sexual health cannot be taught because the public regards the subject as unclean and indecent. Thus blinded, mankind presumes to clothe nature in a veil because she seems to them impure, forgetting that she is always clean and that everything impure and improper lies in man's ideas and not in nature herself. It is clear, therefore, that man, not knowing the proper use of the sexual organ and being compelled to wrong practices by the nervous irritation resulting from unnatural living, suffers troublesome diseases in life and ultimately becomes a victim of premature death. Secondly, about our dwelling place. We can easily understand, when we feel displeasure on entering our crowded rooms after breathing fresh air on a mountaintop or an expanse of field or garden, that the atmosphere of the town or any crowded place is quite an unnatural dwelling place. The fresh atmosphere of the mountaintop or of the field or garden or of a dry place under trees covering a large plot of land and freely ventilated with fresh air is the proper dwelling place for man according to nature. And thirdly, as to the company we should keep. Here also, if we listen to the dictates of our conscience and consult our natural liking, we will at first find that we favor those persons whose magnetism affects us harmoniously, who cool our system, internally invigorate our vitality, develop our natural love, and thus relieve us of our miseries and administer peace to us. This is to say, we should be in the company of the Sat, or Savior, and should avoid that of the Asat, as described before. By keeping the company of the Sat or Savior, we are enabled to enjoy perfect health, physical and mental, and our life is prolonged. If, on the other hand, we disobey the warning of Mother Nature without listening to the dictates of our pure conscience and keep the company of whatever has been designated as Asat, an opposite effect is produced, and our health is impaired and our life shortened. Thus natural living being indispensable to the practice of yama, the ascetic forbearance as explained above, to make any attempt to practice yama without living naturally is altogether useless. Purity of mind and body being equally indispensable to the practice of niyama, the ascetic observance as explained above, every attempt should be made to attain that purity. Firmness of moral courage when attained removes all the obstacles in the way of salvation. These obstacles are of eight sorts. Hatred, shame, fear, grief, condemnation, race distinction, pride of pedigree, and a narrow sense of respectability, which are the meannesses of the human heart. By the removal of these obstacles, biratwam or mahatwam, magnanimity of the heart, comes in and this makes man fit for the practice of asanam, remaining in steady and pleasant posture, pranayama, control over prana, involuntary nerves, and pratahara, 
changing the direction of organs, the voluntary nerves, inward. These practices enable man to satisfy his heart by enjoying the objects of senses and are intended for Garyastashram, domestic life. Man can put the voluntary nerves into action whenever he likes and can give them rest when fatigued. When all of these nerves require rest, he sleeps naturally and by this sleep all these voluntary nerves, being refreshed, can work again with full vigor. His involuntary nerves, however, irrespective of his will, are working continuously of themselves since his birth. As he has no control over them, he cannot interfere with their action in the least. When these nerves become fatigued, they also want rest and naturally fall asleep. This sleep of the involuntary nerves is called Maha Nidra, the great sleep or death. When this takes place, the circulation, respiration, etc. being stopped, the material body naturally begins to decay. After a while, when this great sleep Mahanidra is over, man awakes with all his desires, and finding his body unfit for further work, leaves the same and goes somewhere else to create a new one for the accomplishment of his desires. In this way, man binds himself to life and death, and hence fails to get salvation. But if man can control these involuntary nerves by the aforesaid pranayama, he can stop the natural decay of the material body and put the involuntary nerves to rest at times, as is the case with his voluntary nerves. After this rest, these involuntary nerves also become refreshed and work with a new life again. As after sleep, when full rest has been taken by the voluntary nerves, no help is required to be awakened. So after death, also, when full rest has been taken by the involuntary nerves, no help is necessary to be in life again. If man can die, i.e. put his entire nervous system to rest, controlling the natural decay of the body by the aforesaid pranayama, the nerves then being not much fatigued, life comes into play much sooner than after ordinary death, and the whole system being refreshed begins to work with full vigor. Thus, life and death come under control. In this manner, man, saving his present body from decay and from the terrible sufferings of death and requiring no further time for the necessary development of any other material body, can fulfill all the desires of his heart. Thus, he is no more required to come into the world under the influence of darkness, Maya, and to suffer again a second death. Vide Revelations 2, 10 and 11. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Man enjoys a thing when he so desires. At the time of the enjoyment, however, if he directs his organs of sense through which he enjoys towards the object of his desire, he can never be satisfied, and his desires increase in double force. On the contrary, if he can direct his organ of sense inward towards his self at the time, he can satisfy his heart immediately. So the practice of the aforesaid prachahara, the changing of the direction of organs, the voluntary nerves, inward, is essentially necessary for the satisfaction of the worldly desires, by which man remains bound and cannot get salvation from the creation of darkness, maya. Man cannot feel or even think properly when his mind is not in a pleasant state, and the different parts of the human body are so harmoniously arranged that even if any minutest part of it be moved a little, the whole system becomes disturbed. So to comprehend a thing i.e. to feel a thing by the heart clearly, the practice of the aforesaid asanam, the steady and pleasant posture, is extremely necessary. Man, when expert in the above-mentioned practices, becomes able to conceive or feel all things of this creation by his heart. The true conception is called smriti. Fixing attention firmly on any object thus conceived, when man becomes as much identified with the same as if he were devoid of his individual nature, he attains the state of samadhi, or true concentration. When man directs all his organs of sense towards their common center, the sensorium, or shishumnadwara, the door of the internal world, he perceives his God-sent luminous body, Radha, or John, and hears the peculiar knocking sound, Pranava Sabda, the word of God. Vide John 1, 6, 7, and 23. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Thus perceiving, man naturally believes in the existence of the true spiritual light, and withdrawing himself from the outer world concentrates himself on the sensorium. 
this concentration of the self is called samyama. By this samyama, or concentration of self to the sensorium, man becomes baptized or absorbed in the holy stream of the divine sound. This baptism is called bhakti yoga. In this state, man repents, i.e., turning from this gross material creation of darkness maya, he creeps back towards his divinity, the eternal father whence he had fallen, and passing through the sensorium, the door, enters into an internal sphere, bubaloka. This entrance into the internal world is the second birth to man. In this state, man becomes debata, a divine being. There are five states of the human heart, dark, propelled, steady, devoted, and clean. By these different states of the heart, man is classified, and his evolutionary status determined. In the dark state of the heart, man misconceives, i.e., he thinks that this gross material portion of the creation is the only real substance in existence, and there is nothing besides. This, however, is contrary to the truth, as has been explained before, and is nothing but the effect of ignorance, abhijya. In this state, man is called sudra, or belonging to the servant class, because his natural duty then is to serve the higher class people in order to secure their company and thereby prepare his heart to attain a higher stage. This state of man is called Kali, and whenever in any solar system, man generally remains in this state and is ordinarily deprived of the power of advancing beyond the same, the whole of that system is said to be in Kali Yuga, the dark cycle. When man becomes a little enlightened, he compares his experiences relating to the material creation gathered in his wakeful state with his experiences in dream, and, understanding the latter to be merely ideal, begins to entertain doubts as to the substantial existence of the former. His heart then becomes propelled to know the real nature of the universe and, struggling to clear the doubts, seeks for evidence to determine what is truth. In this state, man is called Kshatriya or one of the military classes, and to struggle in this manner aforesaid becomes his natural duty by whose performance he may get an insight into the nature of creation and attain the real knowledge of it. This kshatriya state of man is called sandisthal, the place between higher and lower. In this state, men, becoming anxious for real knowledge, need help of one another. Hence mutual love, the principal thing for getting salvation, appears in the heart. By the energetic tendency of this love, man affectionately keeps company with those who destroy troubles, clear doubts, and afford peace to him, and hence avoids whatever produces the contrary result. He also studies scriptures of the divine personages scientifically. In this way, man becomes able to appreciate what true faith is, and understands the real position of the divine personages when he may be fortunate in securing the godlike company of some one of them who may kindly stand to him as his spiritual preceptor, Sat Guru, the Savior. Following affectionately the holy precepts, he learns to concentrate his self, directing his organs of sense to their common center, sensorium. Shishum Nadwar, the door of the internal sphere, where he perceives the luminous body, John, or Radha, and heard the holy sound, Amen Aum, like a stream or river, and, being absorbed or baptized in it, begins to repent creep back towards his divinity, the eternal father, through the different lokas, the spheres of creation. In the way towards divinity, there are seven spheres or stages of creation, designated as swargas or lokas by the oriental sages, as described in chapter 1, 16. Buloka, the sphere of gross matters. Bubaloka, the sphere of fine matters or electric attributes. Swaloka, the sphere of magnetic poles and aura or electricities. Mahaloka, the sphere of magnet the atom. Janaloka, the sphere of spiritual reflection, the Son of God. Tapaloka, the sphere of the Holy Ghost, the Universal Spirit. And Satyaloka, the sphere of God, the eternal substance, Sat. Of these seven places, the first three, Buloka, Bubaloka, and Swaloka, comprise the material creation, the kingdom of darkness, Maya, and the last three, Satyayoka, Tapaloka, and Janaloka, comprise the spiritual creation, the kingdom of light. Mahaloka, the sphere of Adam being in the midst, is said to be the door communicating between these two, the material and spiritual creation, and is called Dasamadwar, the tenth door, 
or Brahma Randra, the way to divinity by the Indian sages. When man being baptized begins to repent, creep back towards the eternal father and, withdrawing himself from the gross material world, the Bhuloka, enters into the world of fine matter, the Bhubaloka, he is said to belong to the Jwija, or twice-born class. In this state, he comprehends his eternal electricities, the second fine material portion of the creation, and understands that the existence of the external is substantially nothing but mere coalescence or union of his fine internal objects of sense, the negative attributes of electricities, with his five organs of sense, the positive attributes, through his five organs of actions, the neutralizing attributes of the same, caused by the operation of his mind and conscience. This state of man is Dwapara, and when this becomes the general state of the higher beings naturally in any solar system, the whole of that system is said to be in Dwapara Yuga. In this state, the heart becomes steady. If man continues in the baptized state, remaining immersed in the holy stream, he gradually comes to a pleasant state when his heart wholly abandons the idea of the external world and becomes devoted to the internal one. In this devoted state, man, withdrawing his self from Bhuba Loka, the world of electric attributes, comes to Swaloka, the world of magnetic attributes, the electricities and poles. He then becomes able to comprehend Chitta, the heart, the magnetic third portion of the creation. This Chitta, as has been explained in chapter 1, is the spiritualized atom, Abhija, or ignorance, a part of darkness, Maya. Man, comprehending this Chitta, becomes able to understand the whole of darkness maya itself, of which chitta is a part, as well as the entire creation. Man is then said to belong to the bipra, or nearly perfect class. This state of human being is called treta. When this becomes the general state of the higher beings naturally in any solar system, the whole of that system is said to be in treta yuga. Man repenting, creeping back, further lifts up his self to Mahaloka, the region of magnet. Then all the development of ignorance being withdrawn, the heart comes to a clean state, void of all external ideas. Then man becomes able to comprehend the spiritual light, Brahma, the real substance in the universe, which is the last and everlasting spiritual portion of creation. In this stage, man is called Brahman, or spiritual class. This state of the human being is called Satya, and when this becomes the general state of the higher beings naturally in any solar system, the whole of that system is said to be in Satya Yuga. In this way, when the heart becomes perfectly purified, it does no more reflect but receives spiritual light, the Son of God, and thus being consecrated or anointed by the Spirit, it becomes Christ the Savior. This is the only way through which man, being again baptized or absorbed in spirit, can rise above the creation of darkness maya and enter into jana loka, the kingdom of God, i.e. the creation of light. In this state, man is called jiban mukta sanyasi, like Lord Jesus of Nazareth, vide John 3, 5, and 14, 6. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In this state, man comprehends himself as nothing but a mere ephemeral idea resting on a fragment of the universal Holy Spirit of God, the Eternal Father, and understanding the real worship he sacrifices himself there at this Holy Spirit, the altar of God, i.e. abandoning the vain idea of his separate existence, he becomes dissolved or dead in the universal Holy Spirit, and thus reaches Tapaloka, the region of Holy Ghost. In this manner, being one and the same with the universal Holy Spirit of God, man becomes unified with the Eternal Father himself, and so comes to Satyaloka, in which he comprehends that all this creation is substantially nothing but a mere ideal play of his own nature, and that nothing in the universe exists besides his own self. This state of unification is called Kaivalya, the only self. Vide Revelations 14.13 and John 16.28 Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. Chapter 4 The Revelation 
Adeptship is attainable by the purification of the body in all respects. Purification of the material body can be affected by things generated along with it by nature, that of the electric body by patience in all circumstances, and that of the magnetic body by the regulation of the breath, which is called mantra, the purifier of the mind. The process of how purifications can be effected may be learnt at the feet of the divine personages who witness light and bear testimony of the Christ consciousness. By culture of regulation of the breath as directed by the spiritual preceptor Satguru, the holy word Pranava or Sabda appears by itself or becomes audible. When this holy word Pranava or Sabda appears, mantra, the breath, becomes regulated and checks the decay of the material body. This pranava appears in different forms at the different stages of advancement according to the purification of the heart, chitta. It has already been explained what Satguru is and how to keep the company thereof. Man, when endowed with the heavenly gift of pure love, naturally becomes disposed to avoid the company of what is asat and to keep the company of what has been described as sat. By affectionately keeping the company of Sat, he may be fortunate enough to please one who may kindly stand to him as his Satguru, or spiritual preceptor. By keeping his godlike company, there grows an inclination, Prabriti, in the disciple's heart to save himself from the creation of darkness, Maya, and he becomes Prabartaka, an initiate in the practices of Yama and Niyama, the ascetic forbearance and observance necessary to obtain salvation. It may be remembered that by the culture of Yama and Niyama, the eight meannesses vanish from the human heart and magnanimity comes in. It is at this stage that man becomes fit for the practice of ascetic posture, etc. The process is pointed out by his Satguru to attain salvation. When he continues to practice, the process is so pointed out to him, he becomes a Sadhaka, or disciple. On a reference to chapter 3, it will be found how a disciple, while passing through the different stages, becomes able to conceive the different objects of creation in his heart, and how he gradually advances to the state of meditation, and ultimately by concentrating his attention to the sensorium, he perceives the peculiar sound pranava, or sabda, the holy word, when the heart becomes divine, and the ego, Ahankara, or the son of man, becomes merged or baptized in the stream thereof, and the disciple becomes Siddha, an adept, a divine personage. In the state of baptism, Bhakti Yoga, Surat Sabda Yoga, man repents and withdraws himself from the external world of gross matters, the Bhu Loka, and enters into the internal one of fine matter, the Bhubar Loka where he perceives the manifestation of spirit, the true light, like seven stars in seven centers or conspicuous places which have been compared to seven golden candlesticks. These stars, being the manifestation of true light, the spirit, are called angels or rishis, which appear one after another in the right hand of the Son of Man, i.e. in his right way to the divinity. The seven golden candlesticks are called the seven churches, patals, the seven conspicuous places in the body, known as brain, the sahasrara, medulla oblongata, the ajna chakra, and five other centers, cervical bisuda, dorsal anahata, lumbar manipur, sacral swadhisthan, and kokajil muladhar, where the spirit becomes manifested. Through these seven centers or churches, the ego or son of man passes towards the divinity. Vide Revelations 1, 12, 13, 16, 20, and 2, 1. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man. And he had in his right hand seven stars. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In this state of baptism, bhakti yoga, or surat sabda, yoga, the ego, surat, the son of man, gradually passing through the seven places mentioned above, acquires the knowledge thereof. And when he thus completes the journey through the whole of these regions, he understands the true nature of the universe. Withdrawing himself from Bubar Loka, the fine material creation, he enters into Swarloka, the source of all matters, fine and gross. 
There he perceives the luminous astral form around his heart atom, the throne of spirit the creator, provided with five electricities and with two poles, mind and intelligence, of seven different colors as in rainbows. In this sphere of electricities, mind and intelligence, the source of all objects of senses and of organs for their enjoyment, man becomes perfectly satisfied with being in possession of all objects of his desires, and acquires a complete knowledge thereof. Hence the astral form aforesaid with its electricities and poles, the seven parts thereof, has been described as a sealed casket of knowledge, a book with seven seals. Vide Revelations 5, 1 and 4, 3. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on a throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. Passing through this Swarloka, the Son of Man comes to Maharloka, the place of magnet of which the ideas of manifestation, time, space, and particle, or atom, are the four component parts. As has already been mentioned in chapter 1, this Maharloka represents Abhijja, the ignorance, which produces the idea of separate existence of self, and is the source of ego, the son of man. Thus named Manava, being the offspring of ignorance, and the ignorance being represented by the four ideas aforesaid, these ideals are called the four Manus, the origins or sources of man. The Maharloka, the place of magnet as explained before, is the Brahmarandra, or Dasamdwara, the door between two creations, material and spiritual. When Ego, the son of man, comes to the door, he comprehends the spiritual light and becomes baptized therein. And passing through this door, he comes above the ideal creation of darkness Maya, and entering into the spiritual world, receives the true light and becomes the son of God. Thus man, being the son of God, overcomes all bondage of darkness Maya and becomes possessed of all Aisharyas, the ascetic majesties. These Aisharyas are of eight sorts. Anima, the power of making one's body or anything else as small as he likes, even as an atom, Anu. Mahima, the power of magnifying or making one's body or anything else, Mahat, as large as he likes. Lagima, the power of making one's body or anything else, lagu, as light as he likes. Garima, the power of making one's body or anything else, guru, as heavy as he likes. Prapti, the power of apti, obtaining anything he likes. Basitwa, the power of basha, i.e., bringing anything under control. Prakamya, the power of satisfying all desires, kama, by irresistible will force. Ishitwa, the power of becoming Isha, Lord over everything. Vide John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Thus man being possessed of Aisharyas, the ascetic majesties aforesaid, fully comprehends the eternal spirit, the Father, the only real substance, as unit, the perfect whole, and his self as nothing but a mere idea resting on a fragment of the spiritual light thereof. Man, thus comprehending, abandons altogether the vain idea of the separate existence of his own self and becomes unified with him, the eternal spirit, God the Father. This unification with God is Kaivalya, the ultimate object of this treatise. Vide Revelations 3:21. To him that overcometh will, I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Conclusion Love rules the court, the camp, the grove, the men below and saints above, for love is heaven and heaven is love. The power of love has been beautifully described by the poet in the stanza quoted above. It has been clearly demonstrated in the foregoing pages that love is God, not merely as the noblest sentiment of a poet, but as an aphorism containing an eternal truth. To whatever religious creed a man may belong, and whatever may be his position in society, if he properly cultivates this ruling principle naturally implanted in his heart, he is sure to be on the right path, to save himself from the creation of darkness maya. It has been shown in the foregoing pages how love may be cultivated, how by its culture it attains development, and when developed, how through this means only, man may find his spiritual preceptor, 
through whose favor he again becomes baptized in the holy stream and sacrifices himself before the altar of God, becoming unified with the Eternal Father forever and ever. This little volume is therefore concluded with an earnest exhortation to the reader that he may never forget that life is always unsafe and unstable, like a drop of water on a lotus leaf, and that the company of a divine personage, even for a moment, can save it, like Noah's ark in the flood. This thought has been very poetically described by the Indian sage Shankaracharya in the following slokas. There's four lines of Sanskrit I cannot read. The end of the book, The Holy Science, by Swami Sri Yukteswar Giri.